All right, everybody, here we are live in the uh, ABLE files. And my very, very special guest today is Dr. T. Colin Campbell making some time to uh, talk to us all. So I'm very, very excited about this. Um, many leaders in all kinds of industry. There's all kinds of leaders, but very few pioneers and trailblazers uh, whose work blazes a trail for those who follow and uh, Dr. Campbell certainly fits that bill as far as I'm concerned, so he gets mad respect from me. So for those of you who don't know, Dr. Campbell's dedicated his 60 plus years professional life to the science of human health, focusing primarily on the correlation between diet and disease, and in particular cancer, uh, his focus on the effects, nutrition, uh, long-term health, and the key emphasis there for those who know me know long-term is the emphasis. Dr. Campbell received his Bachelor's of Science from Penn State, his Master's Degree and PhD from Cornell, where he currently holds the endowed chair as Jacob Gould Sherman, Professional Emeritus of Nutritional Biochemistry in the Division of Nutritional Sciences. He's authored more than 339 papers and is the recipient of more uh, than 70 years of peer reviewed, um, of grant funding, peer reviewed research funding, mostly from the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Campbell co authored, of course, the landmark textbook, The China Study, which has sold more than 2 million copies worldwide and wrote the New York Times bestsellers, Whole and Low Carb Fraud. Hopefully, you can see all those behind me. Um, he's got several, he's been in several documentary films, Forks Over Knives, as you know, uh, Eating You Alive, Food Matters, and Plant Pure Nation featured Dr. Campbell in his research. And Dr. Campbell has been active in, in national, international policy development on food and health for over 20 years. And he's received more honors and accolades than we have time to mention here. And he's finishing his new book, I'm excited to say, due out in 2019, which will attempt to answer the question, why his message on nutrition that contains so much scientific evidence is so difficult for the establishment to accept. And we'll be asking Dr. Campbell as much about that as he wants to reveal today since it's in pre-publication. And there's so much more I could say about Dr. Campbell and his contributions to science of better health through nutrition. And I'd be cheating myself in the audience on what I'm sure would be a stimulating interview if I just went on and on about his accolades. So without further ado, folks, I'm gonna bring Dr. Campbell uh, into the conversation. Uh, Dr. Campbell, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can see you and hear you. Oh, wonderful. And it's, I just want to personally thank you uh, for your contributions to the field of uh, nutrition and research. And uh, I know a little bit about the academic responsibilities for peer review. And uh, I think it goes, um, I think it goes un unappreciated uh, to the masses out there. So uh, a personal thank you for me for your work as uh, hopefully everyone can see your work behind me. And a reminder, everyone hit your share button because we're gonna get down and into it right now. Uh, Dr. Campbell, your new book, uh, what are the topics, any new discoveries, any reinforcement of previous research findings? And if you can just sort of, um, maybe elaborate on why there's so much resistance to the point of outright lies and misinformation about um, plant-based dieting in general. Well, it was back actually in 1982, quite a while ago, that I had been on an expert panel, the National Academy of Sciences, uh, deliberately on the question concerning the relationship between diet, nutrition, and cancer. I mean, this, this panel was in Washington. It was, it turned out, I was one of 13 members of that panel. And uh, that was in 1982. And that was the first so called official report uh, claiming the relationship of diet and nutrition with human cancer. And it, it stirred a big, stirred up a big pot, <laughs> to be honest about it. And uh, I, I was uh, kind of the target of uh, a lot of that because I was only one of the two members who actually had been doing experimentation on this question. And, uh, and mine was on nutritional biochemistry, if you will, and I was saying some things, discovering some things that were not exactly that popular. And in any case, uh, quite frankly, all hell broke loose. Uh, I, I saw it from many different directions, uh, some really pretty serious assaults, if you will. Um, I had a nice career going at the time, really good career, and I'm very excited about things. I was excited about what our report was saying. We thought. It was fairly simple and modest, what we were saying. Just eat vegetables and fruits and grains, if you will. But then, <coughs> excuse me, 
Uh, but then uh, it, that didn't set well with some folks that they were eating with the indices in particular. And so over the years, that continued. And finally, uh, after publishing the China study in 2005, trying to document some of that, you know, our findings, plus some of the difficulties, and then the book whole, and now a third one, um, I'm, I'm trying to basically sort of answer the question you posed. You know, how can we know this information as well as we do? How can we appreciate this as much as we do? And still at the same time, still get this kind of pushback <coughs> from, um, you know, the powers that be. And uh, so I wrote this new book, uh, kind of summarizing a lot of those experiences, particularly focused on the kind of, you know, pushback that I was getting. I'm naming names, dates, and places, and specific events that happened. I'm not complaining because, quite frankly, it was a great experience because it sort of uh, illustrated for me what the issues really were. And the title of the book, uh, tentatively, is something like Behind the Curtain. Ah, okay. Uh, another another uh, t possible title is Selling Our Souls. Okay, makes sense. Um yeah, I, I don't know how you maintain the level of integrity you do just in the last week. Uh, social media is a breeding ground, of course, for disinformation and misinformation, and especially in, in podcasts where nobody fact checks anything. Um, and just in the last week, I don't want to mention names because I don't like to bring publicity or notoriety to people who are uh, just, you know, pandering misinformation. But on one of the most popular podcasts that's out there, uh, there was uh, an apparent debate between plant-based doctor and uh, a non-plant-based doctor, and the amount of scientific misinformation uh, that the guy was uh, referring to. I mean, he was contradicting himself in his own research, and he's saying things like um, dietary cholesterol has no effect on blood cholesterol and saturated fats. Uh, there's no research that shows that saturated fats are linked to cardiovascular disease. Um, and on and on, like no meta analysis. And I know your, <laughs> I know your work in particular, um, you know, has plenty of references. And then there's just sort of the sleight of hand with, you know, um, cherry picked research. One of which was like only only dealt with 1977 to 1983. Didn't deal with anything after that. And just stuff that people who listen don't pay attention to. They just think there's proof because they don't go any deeper. They don't look beneath the surface. And um, for me in particular, in this uh, particular podcast, um, I just for, so you know, like, like the meat and dairy industries, the fitness industry has a lot to protect against a whole food plant-based diet and the research that supports low protein with negligible supplementation. Most people don't realize that the fitness industry is propagated and sustained by supplements, many of which I'd like you to discuss here, particularly Problematic amino acids, uh, whey protein, casein, branched chain amino acids, methionine, arginine, lysine, issues with me methylation, um, whatever of those you'd like to address and, and why and uh, where they may be problematic. Yeah, sure. Well, let me see if I can summarize quickly in a couple of sentences what I think I learned most of all. Um, first off, uh, it's really the whole food that matters. It's really not the individual nutrients in that whole food. In fact, we've got lots of data now showing when, let's say we talk about a particularly good food, let's say, and we know something about its nutrient content. If we take out the uh, nutrients that we think matter and we put them in a pill, and then we try to you know, get the good stuff that way, it backfires in many cases. It doesn't have the same effect. In fact, those nutrients, when in a pill form, will maybe do exactly the opposite. <clears throat> when, when they are in the food form, so that's that's point number one. And uh, isn't it isn't it um, uh, just one comes to mind, Doctor Rui uh, Liu, who did that study? I think you mentioned in in the book Whole about just a few bites of apple has the antioxidant power of vitamin C of 1,500 milligrams, whereas 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C in a bottle basically does nothing. That's right. That's a, that's precisely right. And so this is something we've missed, and we've missed it big time. And, and do, you, 
do you think yeah. this is what allows the charlatans to sort of mix pseudoscience with I've tried to explain it like going to a writing class and telling people the importance of vowels in word structure or exclamation points in sentences and then because they're important just adding them in everywhere like adding a e i o u to words and adding exclamation points just uh because that's the message they hear oh this is important therefore if we isolate it and multiply it and use it more often then it's got to be even better i never heard that comparison before i if you don't mind i'm going to use it it is very similar uh when we just think about one nutrient at a time amongst i would argue at least hundreds of thousands, even millions of different kinds of nutrients that are in food. We know 40 or 50 by name, if you will, but there's so many more when, when you think about the various and sundry isomers and derivatives of a given nutrient that may be present. And you start thinking about how combinations of things work differently than when we work with them independently. So all of that leads to this idea that what we're talking about here is an enormous complexity uh, as far as that is concerned. But we can sort that out. There's ways of sorting that out and figuring out which foods are best. Uh, and that's really where the main, main story is. And so when we have all these possibilities, you can imagine from now until doomsday, uh, we're going to have people pick out their favorite nutrient, if you will, stick it in a bottle, make a claim, and there you have it. And, that, and that's what's going on in the fitness industry, really, really uh, traffics in pseudoscience. And they do this stuff, um, like I just mentioned, to the point where people aren't connecting the dots. Uh, a very popular figure in our industry passed away last week at age 57 of heart, um, you know, of a heart attack. And he was a person who propagated uh, the deification of protein and the demonization of carbohydrates. And of course, had a whack of uh, supplements that he sold at various times and, and had various like, you know, methodologies that wouldn't pass the muster in academia, but were big hits in the fitness industry. So, uh, but no one's looking at the big picture. I mean, that's the second person in less than five or six years uh, with major heart issues who are promoting a high protein, low carbohydrate diet. And I, I think that's why, I, I mean, if you could narrow, I, mean, I know the reductionism is a problem, but if you could narrow in on some of these problematic amino acids like methionine, um, arginine, um, the fitness industry is really likes to promote the importance of IGF-1 for muscle growth. But I mean, that, that that's a... That's a real rabbit hole, isn't it? It sure is. In fact, I don't even want to talk about the amino acids and stuff like that because I, I okay. don't think any, I don't think any of that stuff is useful. Uh, people may fool themselves thinking it for a while, but that's probably a placebo effect, if anything, because I've gotten to know several world-class athletes in the various sports. I'm talking about Hall of Famers and people like that who have actually tried this in when they're already in their peak of their condition. They've sure. tried and actually gotten better. And then we am really talking about lower protein, not higher protein, especially if protein has come from animal food. So, And this is a... This is what I'm trying to, like, uh, just so you know, this is what I'm saying. I've been arguing that these things have no value in the fitness industry. And I've been actually barred from certain uh, mega websites that used to publish my articles because I say you don't need whey protein and, and casein is an issue. And the branch chain amino acids have even already been debunked for the use in athletics in the research, but no one pays attention to it. And you walk into any, any gym um, anywhere and you see their supplement line is all about whey protein and casein at night before bed. And there's all this, you know, fancy science that supposedly goes with it. But um, I don't I, I, I know why you don't want to talk about it, but it's still a sticky issue in our industry over and over again. Um, when, when you tell people you've gone completely plant based, but where are you getting your protein? And what about your and it just goes on and on. So I, I, that's why I wanted you to address it. At least um, I mean, the China yeah. study and, and casein in particular, maybe you could just address that for a second. Of course. Well, it turns out there's uh, two main sources of protein in our diet. One comes from animals, the other comes from plants. And most people have generally assumed that protein only comes from animals. In fact, the word protein is almost synonymous with meat, if you will. That's been around for decades, so more than a century. And uh, so it's considered very special, if you will. And people are asked, too, when you go on to plant food, you know, where you get your protein from. What they're really asking, falsely, I should say, 
is where where are you getting your meat from? We don't need meat. We get all the protein we need. In fact, we get ideal levels of protein from plants, not from animals. I mean, and is that's is it. that is that related to the research that's evolving on methionine in particular? Maybe you could expound upon that a little bit. Well, methionine got a little bit of corner of the message in a sense. Uh, and in fact, it, it, it was a sulfur amino acid, right? Right. And sulfur amino acids are found in animal foods more prominently than plant foods. And anything that's found in animal foods, automatically that turns on a, somehow turns on a light bulb. And people are like, oh, that's got to be good. Well, the sulfur amino acids in animal food, in reality, create an acid-like condition in the body. And when you have an acid-like condition in the body, and the body doesn't like that. But one thing it does to try to neutralize it, it pulls the calcium out of our bones and weakens the bones in the long range. So that's a bad idea. But the other thing is that the amino acids in animal proteins, methionine included, basically increases the risk for cancer. It increases the risk for heart disease and all the, on down the line. And so, um, you know, the single nutrient might not act quite as much as the, you know, all of them together in the form of food. But still, that's a problem. And young people are not paying attention to that. They apparently don't want to pay attention to it. Yeah, uh, uh, people, um, you know, um there's there's a saying from uh, I write down a lot of sayings. Like uh, there's a saying from uh, the Game of Thrones. There is uh, belief is the death of reason. And even like as recently as last week, like I said, this um, what you just said. I mean, it's well known that animal proteins are linked to cardiovascular disease. Uh, am I wrong to say that meat in particular is carcinogenic, obesogenic, atherogenic, and diabetogenic? And would I be incorrect in those statements? Is there anything that I'm painting a brush with too generally? Well, it's a fairly general statement, but it so happens you're right. Uh, okay, <laughs> that, that, and and yet yeah. as recently as recently as last week, this fellow on this very popular podcast was saying there's no research that exists that shows that saturated fat is linked to coronary issues. Can you? Can you just debunk that for me? I really would like to know who that person is and where they got it from, because quite frankly, there is a little truth in that. Uh, you know, that, that saturated fat is primarily in, in animal food, right? Right. So you assume it's bad. <coughs> but in reality, it's the unsaturated fat in plant foods when consumed out of a bottle, like cooking oil and stuff like that. That's really what's bad. Um, okay. So there are there's a certain certain few ideas in, in this field that have been carried along and have become mythological. And, and really, if, once again, that kind of uh, mythology is coming from the focus too much on single nutrients. And the reason is just with that. I wrote a paper on that, and then we could go on and on about that. But I'm, in, in the book that I'm now writing, I have one chapter devoted to some of these things that we've taken for for gospel for truth. Even in the plant-based community, they're not quite right, and the reason that happens, and so that that spoils the party for us. You know, when we that kind of stuff to creep in, and so what, what we want and what we need to do is to come back to the concept of whole food, realizing things work together in magical ways, or maybe I should say the ways of nature. I mean, nature is pretty magical, um, and so yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say amen. I, I'd rather you would just expound upon these things. Uh, uh, I'll get to my next point in a second. Yeah, well, I say, you know, as long as we keep focusing on individual things, individual uh, chemicals in food, we're going to get into trouble. And whether we're trying to argue it uh, in, in a case that makes it look good or whether it turns out to be bad, is almost beside the point. It comes back again to the question concerning whole foods. And the idea is really simple. It is so simple. You know, the biochemistry is enormously complex. That, I, I grant that. And we'll note, you cannot know all those details ever, ever, ever. But we can get a really good sense of what the whole is. And it's amazing because if we eat just, my, my message is really simple, just two ideas. It covers the waterfront. First off, eat whole foods. That's a mouthful, <coughs> but it really works. Secondly, don't eat food with animal protein in it. Not Boom. Just, All right, yeah. good. All right, go ahead. Not, not just because the animal protein per se is, account, accounts for all of the effects. It doesn't. The fact is when we eat animal foods, we're actually decreasing the consumption of plant foods. And right. there's where we get the, the big, uh, really the good stuff. 
in the bucket loads. And so, you know, so those two methods are really very simple. <clears throat> and the whole food thing, I, I like that because that pushes aside the use of supplements. That right also Go ahead. Push, that also tends to push aside to our excessive use of oils out of a bottle or sugars, you know, too much free sugars and refined sugars. Yeah, I think so, oil oil replaced sugar as the sort of like spread on your food kind of like idea. Um, and then that becomes problematic because it's processed as well. Is that your point? Yeah, there's, yes, it's, 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 yes, processed in part, but it's also the fact that being consumed in isolation of all the other stuff that comes with it when we eat in the whole form of whole food. I mean, fat and oil is good stuff. Right. We need some of it. But, you know, you should eat the foods that have it, not, not squeeze it out of a whatever and put it in the bottle and then pour it on salads and, and pour it in a frying pan, stuff like that. that that's where we get the difficulty. I like your idea. Like Einstein said, um, you know, uh, the truth is simple and simplicity is the truth and um, genius lies in simplicity. Uh, I've always said in, in all the things I've written about diet and metabolism, et cetera, that uh, there is two essentials to any uh, diet strategy. And I like the word diet strategy over diet. Um, and the two essentials of any diet strategy are one, it must be sustainable. And two, it must serve the body. Um, is there anything you would add to that? Like, a one, is does that um, is that too simple? No, I, I like your word "incidentally sustainable" uh, because uh, on on two counts, if I as I think about it, uh, that kind of diet can be sustained, you know, with a great deal of joy once you get used to it. And so, for some people, it might take a month or two, but that's nothing. Once you get really custom that kind of diet, our taste preferences change. So therefore, we can sustain the diet. A lot of people don't realize that. The other word, the other uh, part of that word, sustainable, that you just used, that I find really very interesting, is that we need to start thinking about sustainable food production. Oh yes. Yeah, and sustainable agriculture and so forth. You know, taken from the ground. What we're doing right now, we're just a, a lot of the environmental problems we have. It's because we're actually eating the wrong food. Yeah, yeah. and I, I didn't know how much you wanted to get into that element because of your research in the biochemistry of nutrition. I didn't know how much you wanted to talk about the environmental what? sustainability, um, uh, even in, I, I can't remember if it was Forks Over Knives or What the Health or whatever, but you even had dairy farmers claiming that, that this isn't sustainable. Um, yeah, it's interesting. If somebody, uh, I, I don't vouch for this, but I'm going to repeat it. Uh, because I think it is symptomatic of a trend. Somebody told me, in fact, I saw it on the internet not too long ago, about a year ago when the dairy scientists, if you will, in England were gathering for their annual meetings or whatever it was, their leader, the chairman of the group, I think it was, said something like, in 10 years time, boys, the dairy industry is going to be gone in England. And it was sent to me because I've also done quite a lot of things in, on the other side of the pond too. And uh, sure. there's that to uh, some of the work that I've been doing. But in any case, that's what's happening. Uh, the dairy industry in this country has been declining for some years, especially with respect to raw milk and fluid milk. And so to replace that loss of income, what they've done is to turn it in and you know, start making cheese, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So that's going up. But in any case, I think the dairy industry is in trouble. And I hate to say that because I'm from a dairy farm. I milked cows. I grew up that way. My, you know, I had no idea, no intention whatsoever to ever raise these kind of questions. But, yeah, I think know, I think a lot of people don't realize that. Who, I mean, people um, who live under a rock who haven't seen any of the um, any of these documentaries and don't know anything about you. One of the things I marvel at is, in, in if anyone had a reason to be partial to what I call paradigm blindness and paradigm bias it would be you growing up on a dairy farm and yet the china study the main thing it revealed was issues with dairy protein and the whole of dairy in general no absolutely i mean yes i was on a dairy farm i milked until i was 25 i had graduate school and my dad sold the farm but my, certainly when i was home in summer but that was one thing but my Doctoral dissertation actually was specifically on the idea of promoting the consumption of more animal protein and then more milk, if you will. That's where it was. And 
But then I got involved in the Philippines, helping to uh, run a, a national program of feeding malnourished children. And I can tell you right now, when you see, and I saw this kind of thing, I saw a lot of malnourished and starving children who at the time, uh, they didn't, they, you see that, that stays with you for the rest of your life. And so I was very much moved by, you know, the malnutrition that some people suffer and got into my game, if you will, uh, from that perspective and then started studying things. And uh, yeah, the dairy is a, is, it was great life. I, I loved the farm. Um, I, I worked, you know, with that in mind and hoping that was going to be my life, I guess you could say. Right. But it wasn't and because the evidence was too persuasive. Oh, is it ever? <laughs> I mean, the, I mean the, yeah, it's a, no other way around it. And that's the only reason I actually uh, got to the point where I did it strictly through the science and uh, really extensive experimentation that we did. I had lots of students, a lot of colleagues, and so not just me, obviously, but, uh, you know, I had a, a pretty good sized research group of young people. I loved them. And uh, we did a lot of exciting things. And I think it changed the trajectory of, of, real peer review research in, in the field of nutrition forever. Like I said, there's very few trailblazers. There's lots of leaders, but very few trailblazers. And in terms of what you said about, you know, can't ignore the evidence, I want to just address that um, your ability to maintain objectivity in the face of everything that's going on. I'm just posting here on the screen, um, you know, I'm glad you took this on. I want to take it on, but I find I get too emotional and then I start being guilty of the same things I accuse other people of. But if you talk a little bit about, uh, and then we'll get into the dishonesty and, and things like that, uh, not particularly this one, but in general, um, you know, I, I loved your article on uh, the plant paradox and the lectins. And, and uh, I mean, you just basically, you know, you just basically <laughs> took this apart, um, you know, singly and but academically and intelligently and uh you know um with research can you talk a little bit about i, I i'm just i throw my arms up in the air of, of why these people just insist on misrepresenting science i mean obviously for the bottom line but um if you could just comment a little bit maybe on the plant paradox itself because people won't know what that is and then what was um, maybe a little bit um disingenuous about it well, uh, we've heard of gluten sensitivity, you know, gluten-free foods and that sort of thing. Everybody's heard about that. So sure. Got to go off. Just a second to get that up. Okay, so, uh, yeah, the gluten is, it belongs to a class of compounds called lectins. Uh, and so uh, the gluten can be a problem for certain people. There's no question about that. Right. Diagnosed, they have to deal with it, and they can, and they can resolve it, yes. But this is involved maybe two to three percent of the people, or some figures I've heard. It's not that thirty or forty percent of the population. That's not that's garbage. And and the reason that story was put together was actually one of the attempts that this particular gentleman uh, undertook. One of the attempts to discredit what I'm talking about, because you see, lectins are only found in plants. Right, particularly beans and legumes. Correct. So if you if you start saying lectins are no good for you, no lectins, it's not just gluten. It's all the other lectins too. You, then you're really, uh, really cra you basically crashing the whole plant food enterprise, if you will. That fellow did not do a single experiment, have a single publication on that topic in the literature. Yes, he was in medicine. Yes, he, and that, and that tends to sell people on, on the idea that he has a medical degree. What people need to know, by the way, there's not a medical school in the United States, not one, that actually teaches nutrition. No. Oh. Oh, I lost you, Dr. Campbell. Uh, let's see if I can get you back here. Um, you must have hit. Hang on. We'll bring you right back. Yeah, we lost you there for a minute, Dr. Campbell. You must have hit a button or something. Um, okay. So you were you were you were talking about uh, not a single uh, university uh, higher education um, institution in the United States uh, has nutrition yeah. has a nutrition degree. Yeah, I'm saying medical schools, the ones that teach Med doctors. Medical. Yeah, medical the, schools. Sorry. Wonderful people. They went to school because their motivation in large measure was to work and help with other people. Yet they're not taught the most important medical science of all. Isn't that something? Isn't that credible? And then the second thing is that 
that even for those who may get self-educated, they want to do it, they want to work for their patients, there's no good way for them to be reimbursed for their services. You know, yeah. I'll be specific. There's about 130 medical specialties in our, in our country that are used by insurance agencies and others for reimbursement purposes. 130. You know, one for cancer, one for this, one for that, a lot of detail. Not one is called nutrition. Wow. So here you have physicians not trained in the subject, number one. Number two, for those who are inclined to want to learn something about it, it's very difficult for them to get paid for their services. This is one of the reasons that the American public tend not to know, because we're talking about a system, a system, a hierarchy, you know, where, for example, nutrition has been excluded from that discussion for decades or for more than a century. It's really very interesting. And of course, the question then becomes, why, why has that happened? Well, you see, nutrition is nature. It's free. Right. It, it doesn't really make much money for people that might be in, in that sort of business. So what has happened over, and I really got into the, this book I'm doing now, really tracing the history back to the 1700s. It's really fascinating. You know, how did we get in the wrong, going down the wrong track? It's really interesting that because what evolved in, during those years was be able to identify a specific cause for a specific disease, a specific chemical to do something specific, maybe operate through a specific event or mechanism. The reason for that is then if we can find the mechanism, if you, if you will, because you know that from the book whole, if we can find the mechanism allegedly responsible for a certain outcome, maybe we can make a chemical, block it. Maybe we can, you know, we make a drug. This is the basis for the entire drug industry. So all Certainly. of a sudden we have, we have two basically broad pathways we could have followed. We only followed one. We followed the one that makes money. That's and I think, and that's true in the fitness industry does the same thing with the supplement industry. They, they misrepresent um, studies and, and nutrition in order to like be able to bank uh, on supplements and sell supplements, um, you know, and there's a lot of money to be made in it. I, I, one of the points I wanted to make, just going back to what you were talking about, I think is essential. That's something I've been saying in my industry as well for a long time is the problem with academic honesty, like yourself and others that present academic honesty and integrity, talking about gluten and talking about the rest of it, it gets so twisted and misrepresented in the fitness industry that when you say something like lectin and gluten is an issue for maybe 1% of the population, it gets twisted and turned. And in the fitness industry, it gets represented to convince everybody they're part of that 1%. So all of a sudden, everyone thinks, well, that's me. I'm 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 gluten intolerant. I'm I'm carb resistant. I'm uh, does carb resistance even exist? You said you said it perfectly. Okay, all right. Um, it's, 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 it, yeah, I know exactly the game. <laughs> and and that it's a problem for me. I mean, um, people gain. They don't understand the way our industry works in that it's propagated by supplements. The mega websites are su actually supplement selling websites. So they sell what they sell is magical solutions like you discussed um, in single cause, single effect. And then those people who will also support that, who write articles promoting protein powders and and, you know, this magic ingredient and that magic ingredient, they'll be given and risen to the level of guru. And then they get a following and then you can't even argue with them based upon uh, because it's got such a following and no one wants to admit they've wasted their money. So in our industry, uh, the saying I like to use is that ignorance, ignorance and arrogance when combined together are the only walls that intelligent reason can't penetrate. And um, if you could just comment on that for a minute, I'll give you an example if you want, but uh, go ahead. Well, the words ignorance and arrogance come from the same root word to some extent. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of self, it, it's, it focuses on self. You know, if you're arrogant, a person who's arrogant or, is basically saying, hey, I know more than you do, you know, that kind of thing. And they really go out on a limb. Whether they do or not, that's beside the point. That, that's, that's one point. Uh, ignorance is a little, little better word. Somebody's willing to admit their ignorance, that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, okay, but, uh, yeah. But some, on the other hand, sometimes those people don't want to admit their ignorance. They well, they double they they double down, right? So that's um, 
exactly. know, uh, it, it's amazing to me how many people, I call it the supplement mentality. And yeah. uh, I, I've been around a long time, you know, in, in my industry. And I've always been amazed at the, the, what I call the supplement mentality that there's these people who will buy into whatever, um, you know, snake oil of the month exists and it's the best thing. And, you know, I've got all these results and I got this result and that result. And then when the turn, when the turn of the calendar comes and the next magic supplement comes, then they're on board with that. And this is the best. And, and I always feel like saying to them, well, what happened to the, the magic supplement from last year that you were raving about all of a sudden, you know, that that's no good. And this new one is, and it's, it's a belief system that never changes. And in fact, it's, it's one of the things I brought up, um, about that uh, popular figure in our industry who died of a heart attack last week at age 57. He was demonizing carbs and deifying protein without looking at, without even maybe accepting that he was, he, he was doubling down on his belief system, but at the same time talking about things like, well, he was, uh, his heart issue is because he's low in magnesium and the research shows all this. And, and um, you know, uh, they were operating things like uh, really, really like, pseudoscientific nonsense like um, using calipers to uh, do skin fold measurements and six different areas of your body and by that you could tell what micronutrients and hormones your body is short of or dysfunctional with and therefore they just happen to have the supplement in the bottle that would cure that and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy not only is this stuff ridiculous dr campbell but people were lining up in cities all over the world to get certified in this nonsense uh, could you maybe address a little bit of that i won't even tell what the name of it is but i mean this is the kind of stuff i have to deal with all the time yeah it is a product of our system and people like to get fame and fortune yeah fame in the area of science that uh not necessarily always getting money but fame at least uh, fortune, obviously, for obvious reasons, that's part of the game plan. And, uh, and and this whole idea of just relaxing and trying to figure out what the simplest solution is and actually helping other people. You know, but or, don't, or, don't, you don't you think, don't you think, though, that people like to hide behind complication? Because yes, if yes. it's simple, then they have to own the fact that they're struggling with type 2 diabetes or they're struggling with weight or they're struggling with... Um, would you agree that there's a little bit of that? Yes, definitely. Uh, you know, complexity, by the way, uh, as you know, creates confusion. And, you know, if we, if we have a very confused state of affairs, of knowledge and so forth to work from, uh, that kind of uh, plays in, in, into the hands of those who want to take a little piece of information and exploit it. Because, you know, oh, it's, confusion is a big, big problem. And that's actually one of the reasons, one of the motivations for my writing this book I'm on now, because I don't think we need to be confused. I, really I, it, it certainly doesn't seem that way. I think the problem is people get their information from social media rather than looking at the research like you do. And when you look at the research, it's a pretty clear argument. Uh, it's not like there's not a whole lot of... Um, you know, like, uh, oh, it could be this, it could be that. I mean, the, the the picture becomes pretty damn clear, but then you see people who deliberately traffic in misinformation, which I don't understand. Um, for instance, there was a, I know you don't like the term vegan, you like the term whole food plant-based, and yet even that term is being co-opted. Um, I just saw last week uh, a doctor, um, a medical doctor, was debunking um the research on um, all-cause mortality to do with uh, low-carbohydrate intake. And when you looked at it again, no one fact-checks. He didn't debunk anything. Um, and in the end, he referred to a paper which didn't even pass peer review. It was just posted on a website somewhere with meat-friendly people. Um, and then uh, another guy who is also a doctor, um, a keto kind of guy, um, he right away, right away, this is the unabashed world we live in of sort of the, the Trump effect. He starts his video by thanking the pork industry for sponsoring his video. And then he goes about debunking the plant-based uh, or debunking the low-carb movement and debunking that animal proteins are bad. And at the end, he also co-ops the term whole food plant-based, but his plate is a big cut of, of um, you know, um, pork tenderloin with a little bit of veggies on the side, and then he, he employs the term whole food plant-based. I mean, that stuff just makes me insane. 
Yeah, unfortunately, it's no words. Uh, words matter, and people co-opt the words to make their own point, and they distort it, and they do every, every other thing. Incidentally, uh, I I happen to have liked science a lot. I became a great, you know, a great deal of fascination. That was my career, and and when I got into it, uh, I I learned that as far as research is concerned, the kind I like is actually doing the experiments. And you know, there's this, this is an old philosophy that goes back, you know couple thousand years or more just the whole nature of science science is the idea in my view it should be the art of observation you see something you see oh that's interesting but if you if you're in science you want to do some research you say okay you make a hypothesis i think this works or that works what it, what it is you then sit down and actually do the experiments and when you get the results the, the part of science is that you have to take those results and submit them for peer review you have to be willing to actually let your peers have a look at it. Maybe they'll debunk it, okay, they debunk it. They come back and forth so you have a debate. I actually like that part of my life, having the discussion back and forth. And oh, so, and I, I know you do, but I don't think people, uh, the consumer, uh, the consumers don't understand the bur the burdens of peer review. They don't understand the level of demands. For instance, the plant paradox, he can go say what he says, publish a book, and I just happened to search after you completely dismantled his argument. I looked on Amazon. Well, no wonder, uh, you know, they can do a book like that. Not only was his book on Amazon, but then there were cookbook variations and there was this variation and that variation. And and uh, I did a whole series of lectures a, a couple of years ago called um, Low Carb Lies on the Politics for Profit. And basically people still don't get that what you do as a scientist is completely different from what Atkins did as a as an author. I mean, shouldn't that book be more fitting to be in the fiction section rather than the nutrition section? Yeah, I'd like to comment that uh, his uh, wife uh, said after uh, Robert Atkins had passed away, uh, she said that her husband never once wrote a peer reviewed paper and was proud of it. Jesus. In other words, he was really throwing darts. She was throwing darts. I mean, they came away near the end of his career. He had something like a hundred million dollars. He had gained on all of his books, so I'm told. He was playing supplements. He did that too. And so, uh, you know, everybody, I, that's just the way it is. I mean, they they uh, they go about and doing their things, and then throw darts. You know, something they don't understand or they don't want to understand, or that's you know can, you know counteract what they happen to say. There's just like, I mean, just like Lane Corvain, um, I, forget, I don't think I got his first name wrong, but I mean, uh, Cordain, I mean, you know, the paleo diet, he was never a paleontologist. Um, and then the paleontologist completely dismantled that argument. Um, it, it's just, I, I don't know how you don't get frustrating when it, when you go to the bookstore and the China study sitting there beside paleo on one side and Atkins on the other. I mean, it just, it makes my head explode. Well, I debated uh, Lauren Cordain three times, and he liked to say, and he did this one time on the Larry King show, he says, he calls me Colin, he says, Colin, you know, you and I just think this alike. Well, I knew what he was going to say, no, Lauren, we don't. <laughs> but, you know, he, just wanted, he, wanted, he wanted to try to minimize, I guess, the, the, the difference of opinion. Of course, I have a very different opinion, but uh, that's the way it is. I mean, he, he was a little more respectful than some of the others. Some of the others are... Yeah, and you can get frustrated, but you know what? Let me tell you one thing I, I did. During my career, I was getting a lot of pushback, some of it really nasty, as I said, throwing me at, trying to throw me out of my society, you know, get me uh, fired from point. No, I have to uh, patent. They never could have a penny. They couldn't do that. You know, really, really serious stuff. And so after a while, and, then, and I was in the national positions of various sorts, I was getting letters. Instead of sitting there and bothering myself with trying to get all worked up about what somebody was saying and sort of doing I got to a point where I took these things and I, I just threw them into a file. I labeled the file the garbage file. <laughs> so the garbage file got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then finally, when I sat down to write this book, I said, I'm going to go back and read some of that stuff I never even read. So I, I kind of now have seen the story evolve and how the individuals who were involved in it would pop up in different places. Um, and so there's almost like an industry out there uh, that is uh, – just attempting to just, just um, abolish, you know, good information. 
because it doesn't play into their into their hands. And they don't like they don't want this kind of this information because it, as you already said, it, you know, it doesn't discredit what they're what they're trying to say. Yeah, uh, I I think um, you know what you said about you know observation is you know goes back as far as you know science goes back and that's what you enjoy and um the burdens of science are such that not everyone can exercise that kind of observation however there's general there's general common sense observation um that people can just look around them for instance um i'll, I'll use two examples here um wouldn't you yourself be a testament to the effectiveness of a plant-based diet i mean if carbs were so bad wouldn't you be suffering a, lit a litany of health issues yourself by now? And on the other side of that coin, that you know of, are there any 75 to 85 year old nutritional experts out there who are living testaments to a keto diet lifestyle that's been sustained for decades? I don't know any, they're all gone. I, actually, some of my, my contemporaries at the time have now passed on. I, I'm 84, uh, I have never taken drugs, except I've taken an aspirin on occasion for a while I did. Uh, but uh, that was because I wasn't fully on a plant-based diet. But I use no drugs. My wife is 78. She's the same way. Our family are now 21 in number. Uh, we've got five children, 11 grandchildren, some, some spouses. None of us take any pills. Boom. Any pills. Yeah. I, as I say, I, I should knock on wood. I'm a case of one, so people can take it or leave it. But, uh, yeah, I did leave that, live that lifestyle. Thanks to my <laughs> wife. Yeah, that's you know, I, I, getting off, like, just, um, you know, I want to expand on on that a little more, getting beyond the plant-based, you know, sound arguments for the plant-based diet. The, test, the testament that your life shows about it, you just said you're 84 and you just finished your latest book. When my father was 84, he was already in and out of hospitals constantly. He was a bound to a wheelchair with open sores all over his legs and his feet very, very painful from, um, you know, uh, cardiac issues, 60 years of smoking and never had anything green in his diet that I ever saw. Um, and then here you are, like you just finished another book. Um, how can people not integrate those two things by the power of observation that you mentioned and see that, you know, the proof of the pudding is, is in the tasting? Um, it's right there. Like, uh, and again, I don't know anybody. These, these, the, this guy on the podcast I mentioned earlier, he's young compared to you and I, um, get him to produce someone who's in their 75s and 80s, who's still working and being prolific and productive, who's been following a keto diet for decades. I, I, it doesn't there, happen. It happen. There's, there's no such animal, correct? That's right. There's no such animal. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to work in some arguments on, on this book, by the way, of coming up with some ways of looking at information, whether you're in research or not. I'm trying to write in a way which people who are not in science didn't haven't had that opportunity, that they could see it, that it's, I call it, irrefutable proof. You know, and, and let me mention one thing. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting. There's been stuff published, you know, uh, for about... Uh, a 10 or 10 diseases now at least when you compare different populations right, right. With to the level of uh, animal protein they consume and what you see is a straight line if you're yep. familiar with, you know the straight line goes right through the origin right there through the xy origin to say that the moment you start putting that kind of food in your diet then the disease risk goes up for what it happens to be and all these different diseases show the same thing now i have to quickly add this point though some of my colleagues would argue about that and say, that doesn't prove ca causation. Yes, that's true. It doesn't prove causation if you're looking for a single thing. These yeah, chairs are not, that, yeah, that's, that, that's absolutely right. But I don't look for a single thing because that's not the way science should work. That's not the way nutrition works. So you yeah, I, I, you know, I've, 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 I've encountered that argument as well. And I've, all, and I've said, look, if I do studies, uh, from different countries that show that kids who play in traffic tend to get hit by cars and yeah. you come back on me and say that, that, well, that's a correlation. That's not a causation. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's a pretty damn strong correlation, it, especially when it's, uh, you know, in, in high numbers and, and when it's should be common sense, but, 
you know, the other argument I get, of course, is that people like to say uh, down through history, there's never been a culture that uh, survived just on plants. They've always eaten animals. But the key word there is survive. We don't live. Uh, I mean, they lived in a world where there was no refrigeration. There was no microwaves. There was no ovens. There was no agriculture. So it's kind of like a disingenuous argument because when they start talking about that, well, if that's what we needed for survival, then that's the nature of our species. And I always come back with the argument from the 1990s when that plane crashed in the Andes with the soccer team and the survivors ended up eating the remains of those who didn't survive so that they could survive because they're up in the, up in the snow where there nothing grew. So they, they ate their, their dead comrades. Well, that proves we're capable of cannibalism. So maybe we should throw that on the table and start a cannibal diet. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense where you start talking about, well, survival proves this. Well, we don't live in that world. So if we don't need to eat animals to survive, don't we need to start assessing the risk to benefit ratio of that? I mean, is that something you can comment on? Of course. Um, yeah, I mean, it's true that, you know, it's hard to find a society, 100% of whom all live perfect, you know, ate the perfect food, only plants and so forth. But the point is, if you look at these different societies, the closer we get to that, so the closer the societies get to that, the longer they live and the less disease they have. It's that simple. And so, yeah. therefore, it's just, just on a common sense basis, you know, you know, the closer we get to a whole plant-based diet, along with some good exercise, of course, fresh air, etc. I mean, that's 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 the pot of gold. I just had my uh, blood panels done, and they are off the charts excellent. <laughs> I mean, they're just so. I was making arguments there, like you know, if if going from high carbs to really high carbs was problematic for my uh, insulin levels and my A1C and all these other things, um, then why did my lab panels trend to be even healthier than they were before. Uh, it doesn't, again, common sense notions of making connections where correlation isn't causation, but come on. Like like you said, our, you can never get single cause, single effect in something where where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Is that? Um, exactly. That, uh, that old, the whole that's greater than sum of its parts is a very old expression, as you know. I mean, Aristotle and the ancient Greek philosophers, they knew that. Sure. You know, yeah. Like you say, it's common sense. They didn't have all the fancy labs and stuff like that necessarily working, but it was it was just a crazy sense. Well, and and I mean, we can go right back to Hippocrates, right? Let let food be thy medicine, and let thy medicine be thy food. I mean, that's what you're talking about with with your own. Um, I, I'm going to leave you with two things. Is there any supplement at all that you think is viable as a panacea that everyone should be taking? No, none. I should add uh, on, on that, and I'm sure you're aware of this. There is uh, generally advocated for people who eat all, only plants a B12 supplement. Sure. Yeah, that's a harmless thing. I, I'm to be honest about it. I go along with it because my my clinical colleagues say they've seen some evidence of people recovered certain on occasion. But uh, okay, it's harmless. Okay, take that. You know, to be on the safe side. But other than that, there's nothing else. There's certainly no there's no vitamin, if you will. That's, that's uh, all encompassing life. Uh, that, you know, you're not going to just all of a sudden get well and be well. <laughs> yeah, was, you know, you reminded reminded me of one of the things I was disappointed with the so-called uh, plant-based doctor versus the paleo guy or whatever. Um, they got into this argument about vitamin C, and even the plant-based doctor was talking about taking ten thousand units of vitamin C. And I'm thinking, what? You don't you don't know better than this? Like, it's a uh, uh, I mean, and they really, and they even brought up Linus Pauling's name in a in a positive way, and I'm like, wow. I mean, uh, I just expected more, I guess, of of that kind of debate, but I shouldn't expect more on social media because that's what it's devolved into. Um, but yeah, even I, I my my uh, blood panels, uh, Dr. Campbell, I, I made sure I specifically was tested for things that people who are anti-plant based or, or are worried about. So I got my albumin levels tested, my B12, my iron, all of them. They, I mean, my, my B12 was off the charts in the high range. Like it was way, way above. Um, and I don't supplement anything. So uh, I'm, I'm with you on that one. And that's why I've kind of been ostracized from the main websites. But And, and it's not like 
the two of us are anti-supplement. If the evidence was there, oh, of course, that's exactly right. That's what that's what there was science. So, yeah, if if the evidence was there, I'd put something in a bottle and make some money from it. Yeah. But I'm not going to rip off people who pay me to help them. Exactly, exactly. There was the same thing with me in animal protein. I thought in my uh, younger days that was the most valuable nutrient we could consume. But then I saw something different. I had a choice: do I accept that or I do it or not? You know, if I listened to my inner soul and my inner background, I guess I probably should have kept on going and ignored what we saw. <laughs> but it didn't work that way. But by the way. I, can I, can I uh, make a comment on nowhere near the end of your program? Uh, but I would like to uh, make note of an online course we have. Yes. Nutritionstudies.org. I don't get any money. I don't get paid. I get paid nothing for this, by the way. So it's not that kind of thing. But th this course that we have, it's a nonprofit. We partner with Cornell University on this. We've had a fabulously good time. I'm really anxious to talk about this because it's a very different way of talking about nutrition called nutrition studies or one word dot org and we've had about fifteen thousand graduates now and we give uh cme the doctors and uh we're having a good time with that and i i'm and i'm looking for any mechanism we can use to spread this message because the government's not going to do it well we're, we're it'll be in our show notes and i'll get perry to post that he just did actually nutrition studies.org there you go everybody you can see that in your show notes sorry i've ignored your ignored your comments folks but i uh, wanted dr campbell out of myself actually so um and you guys come along for the ride i'll get to your comments in a second uh dr campbell i wanted to leave you with uh, or i wanted to end on something kind of like maybe have you uh think about um and then maybe um you know um just sort of riff on and comment on. I, I thought uh, to use an old movie title as a talking point, if you could consider the totality of your 60 plus years experience in research, what conclusions come to mind in reference to the good, the bad, and the ugly of your findings? Well, first off, if we eat that way, there's an amazing amount of good we can do. We can cut healthcare costs by 70 to 80%. I'm not kidding. If people don't use it right, we can actually begin to solve in a substantial way environmental problems. And we can feed the world. Yeah, we can feed the world. I mean, you know, it takes 10 times, some, something like that, 8 to 10 times the amount of land to get the same uh, unit of nutrient uh, when you put it through the hoof of an animal. Let me say one more thing. Animals that are the strongest and biggest <laughs> are the ones that eat plants. Yes. You know, rhinoceros. Uh, elephants, giraffes, lions, well, not lions, but look at those animals all, they they only eat plants. They get all, and they have the most protein, and they, there they are. So what would be the bad and the ugly of your findings? Would the ugly be the political attacks you endured, just to, just for being honest? It's, it's the, the ugly is really the fact that we rely so much on institutions. And by that, I mean, they may be government institutions, they may be Corporate institutions, you know, I can excuse corporate institutions far better because they have, they do have a job to do and they're, they're pursuing, what, you know, to, to make some money. I understand it. But the government, in fact, doesn't do that. And if I leave one, one message, the government is actually giving us uh, guidelines and sort of things like that, basically, and, and actually proactively denying this kind of information. Yes. So, would like to leave that. It, it, is that is that because of the power of the meat and dairy industries? Do you think? Because I know they came out in a couple states right now that they're trying to block um, people who make nut milks from using the word milk. And then I think it was uh, Missouri or Montana. They don't want um, uh, plant based protein substitutes to be able to be called meat. You're not allowed to say you know like uh, plant based meat or plant based burger or you know like um, so they're really feeling it, aren't they? Yeah, they sure are. I mean, that's almost like schoolboy tactics. You know, you are sort of getting, you know, pushing people around or something like that. And unfortunately, it's much more serious than that. Uh, so uh, it's it's just a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. Uh, if you have time, doctor, I'd just like to post some of the comments. Can we can we do that? Yeah, you can take whatever you like. 
Okay, um, just, uh, well, just uh, some amazing stuff. Or is, are we gonna do some Q&A? Let me just come up here. So folks, I did dominate the conversation, but there was a lot I wanted to get to, especially with uh, the fitness industry's blindness and their, their lack of wanting to accept credible information over just wanting to be reinforced what they wanna hear. Um, so, you know, that's why I dominated the conversation. Usually, Dr. Campbell, I, as I go live, I post everyone's comments and we discuss them. But, um, you know, I wanted to uh, you know, keep track here. So um, I'm going to I'm going to um, actually I think I've taken up enough of your time. I'm just scrolling through these, but there's so many of them. I don't think uh, we if we start getting into one, we'll have to <laughs> get into all of them. Um, people want to know where they can get your books. I assume they can also get your books at uh, the dot .org um, website as well as Amazon, I would assume. Well, Amazon primarily. Okay. Um, and they can see the books behind me as well. So um, can you share with uh, why you dislike the term vegan? Uh, that's one of the comments that we just got. Yeah, the, the vegan is a, is a word that's been used for some years now, as we all know, and it's an attempt to avoid uh, use of animals of any kind for any purpose. Uh, I appreciate that. That's not the issue. Uh, the problem with uh, the vegan and vegetarian uh, practices is that it was born out of uh, ethical considerations for the most part, which I, you know, I, I support. That's not, that's not the issue. I want to really emphasize that point. It's, but they did not really take seriously enough the science. And so the average vegan diet, the average vegetarian diet these days has about the same amount of fat. In fact, it does as meat eating diets. That's a big study done in Europe. And so their diets are not all that great. Yes, they traded away meat, if you will, but then they substituted a lot of fat and sugar and stuff like that. So they have some gains, but not the kind of gains you can get with whole food plant based. And, it, and that's one argument. The other argument is that whereas I greatly appreciate the Big and vegetarian community for what they're doing. That's not the issue. If that is the only argument, the essential argument, if that's all there is, it does it does not set well with a lot of people. Some people don't like to be told they're not ethical. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I get that. So it's yeah. a bit it's a bit pushy, uh, and so I would argue that um, whereas that motivation is just fine with me, it's, it's we, we can't use that as the sole argument if we're making a better world. Right. No, I, I agree 100%. Um, I, yeah. I mix and match both terms only because, like I told you, I've, I've come into contact now that people are now co-opting whole food plant-based, um, you know, even though they're advocating high-protein diets. So, it, it you know, you can't win <laughs> either way when you're trying to present, you know, honest information in a dishonest environment. So uh, yeah. people are asking, Dr. Campbell, when when will the book be released? And uh, there, obviously there's no working title right now, but um, when do you think the book will be out for all of us who are anxious to uh, consume it? I would say the first of the year in 2018 of the new year. All right, so it's gone. It's gone to the editors, and I, I know we we put off uh, we we put off doing this interview because you were just putting the final touches on it. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's a little more yet to do. Uh, it, I got really the, the bulk of it sort of uh, arguments now in place, but I'm working with my grandson on that. Who, That's so cool. He's out at college. He's a great writer, and that was his major. And so we're trying to make it uh, you know easily understood if possible. So. No, that, well, I, I think you do a good job at that in general anyway, but um, sometime it, it's uh, I used to have this argument when I wrote for the various magazines. It's like sometime we should expect more from the consumer rather than dialing ourselves down. We should expect them to maybe like dial themselves up, um, you know, um, and try to try to, you know, educate themselves to a higher conversation and a higher argument. So they're not so. Uh, easily victimized by you know dishonesty that's out there. Can can we finish with them? Um, I just wrote down a couple names: Pritikin and Ornish. And uh, with over your 60 years, beside yourself, are there names that pop out to you that my followers should maybe read and and they'd be go, oh okay, I, I get it. You named a couple already, Dr. Ornish, uh, Dr. Esselstyn. Esselstyn, yes. Universal yeah, heart disease. He's a very good friend. He's done fantastic work. Uh, Dr. McDougall, he hasn't published as, as much in the scientific literature, but John McDougall has done a, a ton of uh, really good things. He's had his own program. And, author uh, author of The Starch Solution, correct? Yeah, right. I mean, he's he's, a, he's been a good friend, Dr. Pam Pop, Popper. I have her on my show tomorrow. 
Oh, really? Yeah, the voice, I have a lot of admiration for what she's been trying to do. She speaks her mind. One of the yes. best things about she, that. She, she definitely does that. I had her on the phone. And I was like, wow, okay. Uh, One of the recent ones in my, my, my experience is Dr. Uh, Michael, uh, Michael Greger. Yes. Right. He's uh, younger than I am. He's a generation younger, but uh, he's done, man, he's done a, 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 just a monumental amount of uh, uh, research from the uh, looking, reading books and stuff like that. He does, does a good job. By the and, way, you know, so I could... speaking of Gregor, and I'm, you know, it, an interesting. I was going to bring up this point earlier, but um, you know, uh, didn't fit. Um, so his book, you know, How Not to Die, very, you know, big seller, very well done, very well researched, like like your stuff. Um, but it's funny because back in 2005, when he wrote the shorter book, Carbophobia, I tried to use that book to get some traction, and nothing back then you know the the zone diet and all these diets were popular and i was trying to say but here is a book that's just nothing but research on low carb lies and atkins and the rest of it and what it's based on and i couldn't get any traction with that at all is it, it do you think that's a, just speaks to the the zeitgeist when they're ready and when they're not ready to like take the next leap yeah there's certainly some of that that's for sure um i'd sort of ask myself our book has done quite well the china study and i Sort of wonder. I was a bit surprised because I didn't know at the time we wrote it that it would be as successful as it has been. But uh, it's really uh, been an exciting journey. I, I don't know what the magic the magic thing. I, I, I'm a little bit biased. Maybe maybe I should say it. I, I really think writing uh, writing the uh, scientific evidence, but first off, document it with evidence that's been published, and you have to read it. You can't read it from somebody else. They have to really do it. And then uh, pulling the, all these bits and pieces together into a story. I, I, that sometimes is not done. We can have a lot of isolated ideas and facts and so forth and so on. But if it's not woven into an, a narrative that uh, creates a story. One, one, one more author I should say before I forget. I don't want to ignore uh, Dr. Neil Bernard. Right. Okay. Correct. I'll, and we'll put, we'll put all these people in our show notes. Yeah, they're, they're um, all, the ones I just mentioned are, are all... Friends, I, th good I think I think I was what I was trying to get at with Pritikin and Ornish was more uh, people um, you know whose shoulders we all stand on now. Not not the current level of I mean the current level is doing great, but everyone uh, my followers would know who all those people are. Um, I'm just uh, you know from the past Pritikin and Ornish maybe not too much, and maybe there's someone I missed is what I was thinking. No, I think uh, yeah, that's about it. I mean, if you look back, uh, Scientific Revolution is, is a book that I always liked. It had to do with uh, paradigms, and that, that's a little more uh, uh, scholarly oriented, I guess I could say. Okay. Uh, 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 Thomas Kuhn was his name, K-U-H-N. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I, I, that was the, that was the essential reading for me in graduate school. I had to read Kuhn and uh, you know all the all the philosophers and things like that. So, um, yeah, that takes us in a whole different direction. That's for sure. Um, yeah, you start, you start. I gained from it because he defined for me this concept of paradigm early in my career. So, I took that seriously. Oh, no, obviously, yeah, yeah. And oh, I think I lost you. Um, hey, well, thanks very much for. Yes, I get your back. I lost you there for a second. Um, I I can't tell you how thrilled I was to have you on, uh, Dr. Campbell. I mean, just like this is just amazing for me. So, uh, all the best with your new book. Maybe when it comes out, we can have you back if you remember me by then, and we'll have you on. And and uh, but I'm sure you'll get uh, several signups on your course from this. And uh, hopefully, this will be evergreen, and people will be watching it on my YouTube channel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, when we when we edit it and we make it all pretty for everybody. And, and um, again, uh, you know, if people want the science and they want the evidence and, you know, they want 60 years of experience, uh, again, consumers have no concept of what that means. I've been in my, an expert in, in my industry for four decades and, and there's just no substitute for that kind of longevity and what you are able to assess and, and dismiss and absorb and make relevant and know what is relevant compared to what isn't relevant. And the consumer has none of that benefit. So it's, uh, 
like 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 you said earlier, Dr. Campbell, the stuff, the kind of stuff that's been thrown at you that is just stuff you can just wave away like a fly, um, you know. But it, to the consumer, they think it's relevant and it's it's a it's a decent argument when in fact it's it's you know usually it's just a nuisance. Um, but I, I again thrilled to have you, Dr. Campbell, and hopefully we'll have you again. And everybody, um, you should be throwing your emoticons across the screen right now for Dr. Campbell. Still working, still a uh, role model to all of us, still living the plant-based life. And if you can find anybody 75 to 85 who's uh, also being prolific and productive on a keto diet lifestyle, I'll have them on the show in a second, but um, I don't think you can bring people back from the grave. So thanks again, Dr. Campbell. I really sincerely appreciate your time and uh, good luck with the book. And um, everybody go out there. You see the books behind me. Uh, low carb fraud. You can start with that. It's a nice, simple read, and uh, it'll get your uh, head turning in the right direction of uh, science over nonsense. So, thanks again, Dr. Campbell, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll see you again. Sure. Thank you very much. Cheers. All right, everybody. How was that? That was pretty damn awesome. So I hope the sound was good. I hope the picture was good. And uh, I'm going to sign us out and I'll uh, see you again uh, tomorrow with Dr. Pamela Popper. Uh, boom. <laughs>